In Northern Europe's cold seas, control of the littorals may not be decided by submarines or frigates, but by which Navy has the better helicopter. While surface fleets and submarines often dominate discussions of naval power, it is the quiet, persistent presence of naval helicopters that gives commanders the ability to see farther, strike faster, and hunt more effectively. Among these platforms, the MH-60R Seahawk has emerged as the standard for Allied fleets, particularly in Denmark and Norway. Its rise tells a story about capability, industrial choices, and the strategic environment in the Baltic and the High North. Denmark was one of the first European nations to commit to the Seahawk. After decades of operating the Lynx, Copenhagen signed a deal to purchase nine MH-60Rs through the U.S. foreign military sales system. The first airframes arrived in 2016, and the aircraft were assigned to Escadrille 723. Initially, they provided a modest lift in capability, but in the years that followed, the Danish armed forces invested in expanding their mission profile. Upgrades to sonar systems, Sonoboy dispensers, and Mark 54 torpedoes have transformed the helicopters into fully-fledged anti-submarine warfare assets. In 2025, Denmark announced an expansion plan that included building new hangars in the Faroe Islands, adding crews, and increasing maintenance infrastructure. These steps underscore that the Seahawk is not merely a replacement for Lynx, but a pillar of Danish maritime defense. Norway's path to the Seahawk was shaped by frustration. Oslo had originally chosen the NH-90 NFH, a European design intended to serve both ASW and search and rescue missions. In practice, the NH-90 was plagued by delays, poor reliability, and high maintenance costs. By 2022, the Royal Norwegian Air Force decided to retire the type entirely, grounding a fleet that had barely reached operational maturity. The choice to abandon the NH-90 was politically painful, but strategically necessary. In 2023, Norway approved a contract worth more than $1 billion to acquire six MH-60Rs, with deliveries scheduled from 2025 to 2027. These helicopters will be operated by 337 Squadron, supporting the Coast Guard and frigates while extending Norway's reach into the Arctic and the North Atlantic. The strategic environment explains why both countries move toward the same solution. The Baltic Sea is shallow and crowded, a difficult place for sonar arrays to operate. Yet it is an area where Russian submarines based in Kaliningrad can operate at will. Farther north, the Barents and the Norwegian Sea form the arena where Russia's northern fleet sorties into the Atlantic. In both theaters, the ability to deploy helicopters with dipping sonar and torpedoes greatly multiplies a fleet's ability to detect and prosecute submarines. Land-based aircraft like the P-8 Poseidon provide long-range patrol but helicopters provide the close-in prosecution and flexibility to deploy directly from frigates or patrol vessels. A single Seahawk can extend the defensive perimeter of a ship group by dozens of miles, covering gaps that radar and sonar alone cannot. The MH-60R's technology reflects decades of iterative development. Its avionics integrate seamlessly with NATO command and control networks, passing target data through Link-16 and other data links. Its ANL-AQS-22 dipping sonar and multi-mode radar provide detection against both submarines and surface vessels. The helicopter can carry Mark 54 torpedoes or AGM-114 Hellfire missiles, giving it offensive teeth against both underwater and surface targets. Compared to the NH-90, which struggled with availability and complex maintenance requirements, 
The Seahawk has a proven record in multiple navies, from the United States to Australia to India. That track record is particularly valuable for small air arms like Denmark's, where every helicopter must count. The kill chain enabled by naval helicopters is worth examining. It begins with detection, sonoboys deployed by the Seahawk, or acoustic data shared from ships and patrol aircraft. The helicopter processes this data, classifies the contact, and relays targeting information to the fleet. Once a threat is confirmed, the helicopter can launch its own torpedo or mark the target for a ship-based weapon. This sequence reduces the risk to the surface combatant and increases the probability of a successful kill. Just as importantly, the helicopter can act as a decoy or sensor node, flying ahead of the group to draw out emissions and extend situational awareness. In confined waters like the Danish Straits or around Gotland, this extended kill chain may mean the difference between ambush and survival. Countermeasures exist, of course. Russian ships and submarines are equipped with electronic warfare suites designed to jam sonar and data links. Adverse weather in the high north often grounds helicopters when they are needed most. The threat of surface-to-air missiles, both ship-based and man-portable, forces helicopters to fly cautious profiles. Maintenance and availability remain constant concerns. Even the best platform is useless if it sits in a hangar awaiting parts. These challenges explain Denmark's decision to expand maintenance infrastructure and Norway's insistence on proven, reliable systems. The lesson of the NH-90 was that ambitious design is not enough. What matters is how many hours per year the aircraft can actually fly. A hypothetical scenario illustrates the stakes. Imagine a NATO naval group transiting the Baltic during a crisis. Russian Kilo-class submarines are reported near the shipping lanes. A Danish Ivor Huitfeldt frigate launches its Seahawk, which deploys sauna boys and detects a faint contact. Within minutes, the helicopter drops a Mark 54 torpedo, forcing the submarine to evade and surface. Meanwhile, farther north, a Norwegian Seahawk from 337 squadron patrols alongside Coast Guard vessels near Tromsø, monitoring for Northern Fleet submarines preparing to sortie. In both cases, the helicopters act as the eyes and ears of the fleet, turning uncertain waters into monitored space and imposing costs on any adversary. Even if no torpedo is fired, the mere presence of a capable ASW helicopter changes the adversary's calculus. The broader implications are significant. By converging on the MH-60R, Denmark and Norway gain interoperability not only with each other, but with the United States, Britain, and other NATO navies operating the type. Training, logistics, and tactics can be standardized, lowering costs, and increasing effectiveness. In exercises like ball tops or dynamic mongoose, joint operations are smoother because crews operate from a common baseline. This represents a form of defense integration by procurement choice, where the act of buying the same helicopter builds a shared operating culture. Looking forward, several developments will shape the role of naval helicopters in Northern Europe. First, the integration of unmanned aerial systems will likely complement the manned Seahawks, providing persistent surveillance with rotary wing drones. Second, the need to operate in Arctic conditions will push upgrades in de-icing, communications, and endurance. Third, the growing threat of long-range precision weapons means helicopters must learn to survive in contested electromagnetic environments relying on stealthy tactics and electronic counter-countermeasures. Finally, the industrial base will need to sustain high sortie rates. Denmark's new hangars and Norway's maintenance planning are steps in that direction. 
Ultimately, the story of the Seahawk in Northern Europe is about adaptation. Small navies facing larger threats cannot afford to rely solely on large platforms. They need multipliers that extend the reach of every frigate and patrol vessel. The MH-60R provides that multiplier, turning each ship into a node in a wider ASW network. For Denmark, it secures the approaches through the Straits and around the Faroes. For Norway, it protects the Arctic lifeline and monitors the Northern Fleet. Together, they show how investment in reliable, interoperable helicopters can shift the balance in favor of small states navigating dangerous waters. The conclusion is clear. In the maritime chessboard of Northern Europe, it is not only the number of hulls or the size of the fleet that matters. It is the ability to see, to find, and to strike below the waves. In that contest, the MH-60R Seahawk is rapidly becoming the decisive piece, one that may determine whether NATO maintains freedom of movement in the Baltic and the High North, or whether adversaries can threaten those lifelines unchecked. The helicopter may be smaller than a frigate or submarine, but in the unforgiving waters of the North, it may well decide who controls the sea.